Palopalava and a warm Pacific greetings to our Heart Help Live session. Over the next few months, we'll be celebrating Pacific Language Weeks and supporting them by encouraging everyone to learn a phrase in a Pacific language. The next one is Kiribati Language Week from the 9th of July. Today we're discussing living well with heart failure with our medical director, Dr. Jerry Devlin. Uh, you may have seen Jerry, uh, Dr. Jerry, um, very recently on Seven Sharp last night and on the AM show this morning promoting our new alcohol position statement. But we're talking about heart failure tonight. But before we get started, a little housekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to add them to the comment section at the bottom and we will cover as many as we can during our Q&A. Please don't include any personal details that others might see. And remember, we're discussing general advice. We don't have access to your notes and we don't know your details about your personal medical uh, journey. So um, please speak to your doctor about your personal condition. Jerry, you've had a long day with an early start. Uh, I know you're very, very keen to discuss this important heart topic that affects around 70,000 New Zealanders. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jerry. Thanks, Jen, uh, and good evening, everybody. Um, what, what, what I'd like to do in the next um, 10 minutes or so is just talk a little bit about why heart failure matters and um, just go over a few uh, you know, comments about heart failure, and then we'll open up the question. I think that's a, probably a good way to start, Jen. Yeah, good idea. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, what is heart failure? Um, and I think this is an important question. Um, a heart failure, it's not a single disease, but it's a syndrome made up of a constellation of symptoms, such as breathlessness or fatigue, that may appear alongside, alongside signs such as swollen ankles, or um, when, when your doctor examines you, they may notice your heart rate's a little bit faster, or they hear some crackles when they listen to your lungs, and it's caused by something wrong in the heart. It can come on acutely, uh, where by that I mean it can come on quickly and severely, requiring urgent attention. Or the symptoms can be a little bit more insidious and creep up on you and they're long lasting and they can be a little bit harder for us to tease up what is actually going on and they can come and go as well. So why is it important? Um, well, firstly, it's common and it's increasing. Um, our prevalence in New Zealand is about 2% of the adult population. 10% um, of people over the age of 65 uh, have heart failure. And uh, like lots of cardiovascular disease in our country and other conditions, the burden falls on equally on Māori and Pacifica. And Māori and tends to present at an earlier age in Māori and Pacifica, about 10 years younger than uh, Europeans. We know that it impacts significantly on quality of life. Um, so people are limited in what they want to do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, more likely to present to hospital because of symptoms, and it is associated with not living as long if you have heart failure. So we tend to recognize two types of heart failure, both equally as common, I think, as, as we, not, we now know, one where the heart muscle doesn't pump as well as it should, called heart failure, where reduced pump function, and one where the heart doesn't relax as well as it should, and we call that heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Now, up until recently, all of the evidence that we have about how to treat heart failure and the benefits of the treatment that we use to treat heart failure have been where the heart muscle doesn't pump well. We're now, we've now got a couple of trials presented uh, in, the last, in the last two years with drugs that are quite exciting to enable us to treat people with heart failure and preserve ejection fraction. And we'll talk a little bit about those as well. So both heart failure reduced and preserved ejection fraction, about 50-50, a little bit different depending on different parts of the world, but about 50-50 with, with um, the incidence and the causes of heart failure. So moving on then, what puts us at risk of heart failure? Well, if you've got blockages in your heart arteries, that might be they've, they've developed over many years. You may have had a heart attack in the past. High blood pressure is a common cause of heart failure, particularly heart failure with, with 
stiff, mus stiff muscle or where it doesn't relax as well as it should. Um, valve problems can cause heart failure, that's either a narrow valve or a leaky valve. And we're recognizing more and more the potential for heart rhythm problems, particularly atrial fibrillation, a common rhythm that as we all get older, for causing heart failure. When I talk about this with, with, with patients, trying to explain why this happens, it's, it's like running an engine too, too, too fast for too long. What happens? The engine, the engine fails, and that's what we see with, with rhythms such as atrial fibrillation. Other conditions that are associated with heart failure include diabetes. You may be born with a heart defect that can lead to heart failure. Um, we know, uh, like lots of things, heart failure becomes more common as we get older. Uh, associated with uh, smoking, alcohol use, uh, thyroid problems, and occasionally we don't know what the cause of heart failure actually is. So what are the typical symptoms someone with heart failure might be aware of. Um, we're all aware of being short of breath. That's the classical symptom that we see, isn't it, Jane? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, people may also be aware of their feet being a bit swollen, their shoes are a bit tighter, um, having difficulty doing things, just, just disinterested doing things because you know you just haven't got the energy to do things. I think an important one to, to, to recognize is difficulty sleeping at night. And we, we will often see, you know, patients coming in to see us that say, hey, doc, I, I can't sleep at night. I've got to use three or four pillows or I've got to sleep in a lazy voice. Yes. Yep. And I think that's something, you know, if, be aware of those symptoms. Other symptoms include your tummy been a bit swollen, um, cough with frothy sputum, getting up at night to go to the loo a lot more and just not just not just been out of sorts really things are a little bit harder so how do we diagnose heart failure uh, well when we see someone who we think have got symptoms and when we and when we examine them signs that we believe are consistent with heart failure we then look at what are the tests that actually may confirm or refute the diagnosis of heart failure so more often than not your GP will do an ECG uh, that may show signs damage of an old heart attack, for example, uh, blood pressure effect on the heart. We may do an x-ray looking for fluid in the lungs. But more and more today, we're doing blood tests. And the, the, there's a simple little blood test that a lot of the work, actually, uh, that's brought this blood test to the front line of how we diagnose and exclude heart failure has been done here in New Zealand. Uh, you're probably aware of that, Jim, yes. by the, our colleagues down in Christchurch. They pioneered a lot of the work with this. So it's a blood test called BNP. So if you've got symptoms and you go and see your doctor and he does this blood test, and if this blood test is not elevated, it's highly unlikely that your symptoms are due to heart failure. So it's a really good test at helping exclude heart failure. If it's elevated, it's likely that it's heart failure. Um, so what do we do then? We might, we'll, we'll end up referring for a, an echo scan or an ultrasound of your heart, and that lets us know, is the heart muscle pumping well or is it not relaxing well so it helps guide us to what what else might be going on and what the valves are like looking for a valve potential valve problem right. for, for heart failure so important that we all understand what are what are the treatment goals uh, in someone who we have diagnosed heart failure well the first thing really is to make someone feel better that's really important, isn't it? To improve your symptoms, get rid of your symptoms, and improve your quality of life. We also want to prevent hospital, presenting to hospital due to worsening heart failure, and make people live longer with heart failure. And that's what our treatment is designed to do, all with those three aims. And that is often a combination of medicine, uh, lifestyle is really, really important, which we'll talk a little bit about as well, uh, an ongoing management and monitoring uh, of your symptoms and how you're doing. Occasionally, we may look at putting devices in, and those, de those devices may well be in selected patients. It may be a defibrillator, a shock box, or a pacemaker, and occasionally surgery for valve problems or lots of blockages in the heart arteries. With the goal to, to improve your quality of life, uh, make you feel better, prevent hospital stays, and live longer. So if we look at the medications, one of the pillars of that really is a water, 
a water pill or a diuretic, and that's to get, helps the body to get rid of sodium and water, and that reduces excess fluid and lowers pressures within the heart and relieves symptoms. So that's a really good first step to, to improve your symptoms. So your heart doesn't have to work as hard. Yep, then. yep, yep. But moving on from that, we then look at four classes of me medications that many of the people in the audience may actually be on. They include pills that we've treated blood pressure with for many years, uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. They've been around for a long time to treat blood pressure, but we also know that they improve quality of life, reduce hospital presentations, and improve your life expectancy with heart failure. So that's one class or pillar of medication. Beta blockers have been around for a long time as well, and they do exactly the same thing. So again, improve quality of life, reduce hospital presentations, and improve life expectancy. Another class of medications that we probably don't use as much as we should is mineral corticoid antagonists. Spironolactone is the classic one we have available to, to us in New Zealand, and that does exactly the same thing. Makes you feel better, reduces hospitalizations, and improves life expectancy. One of the exciting classes of medications which we do not have funded access to in New Zealand is a class of medications called SGLT2 inhibitors that are available for diabetes in New Zealand, selected people with diabetes. And again, they do all the same thing. Importantly also, this is the first class of medications if you've got preserved ejection fraction that reduce hospitalizations. So we're very keen to get access, funded access to these medications in New Zealand. And that's one of our roles. It's a heart foundation to continue to lobby and advocate to get these new okay. treatments into New Zealand. So Jerry, if you have uh, diabetes and also heart failure, would you be? Really, you, really good you, question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah. you would be eligible to have funding to be able to? to yeah, yeah, so, so, so again, some of the audience tonight may well have diabetes and may well have heart failure and they may be eligible to commence this medication so it's worth a conversation with your gp about that this medication class specifically yeah so at this stage if you don't have diabetes you can't access this drug but hopefully that will change at some stage. correct there is no funded access in new zealand for this drug um so unfortunately we don't see heart failure occurring in isolation. Many people have other problems, uh, such as diabetes, such as kidney disease, lung disease, and your treatment, and what we can use, and the doses we can use, are likely to be influenced by the other, thing, other things going on. I mentioned atrial fibrillation earlier on. A lot of people with heart failure have atrial fibrillation as well, not just as a cause of the heart failure, but as a consequence of the heart failure. And that may result, that almost certainly will result in on other medications, blood thinners in particular. Uh, the, the, the common ones we use here would be uh, Xeralto and Pradaxa. So you may be familiar with those names. Um, a, another medication that we do use and are using increasingly is iron. So not oral iron tablets. Iron, oral iron tablets don't have any benefit in people with heart failure. But we recognize that a number of people with heart failure are iron deficient. Don't fully understand the reason why that is, but they're iron deficient. And if we give them iron through a drip, it actually makes them feel better and reduces hospitalization. So we will, you know, we're starting to see more iron used to make people feel better. Does it make people with heart failure live longer? Big trial that New Zealand has been involved in will report later this year, and we will know some further answers at, 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 at that stage. So, Jerry, when you say iron deficient, you mean anemic or anemia be another way to uh, well, necessarily not necessarily like anemia. Uh, so, your your blood count might actually be normal, but your iron okay. stores are actually low. Um, I mentioned <coughs> some people might. And some of the audience may well have devices, they may have a pacemaker, they may have a defibrillator, and they may have a fancy pacemaker and combined defibrillator. And they are used in selected people with heart failure. So it's a careful evaluation about who is likely to benefit from these that goes on before we make decisions about who we might look at putting these devices in. Um, surgery, if you've got Narrow, severely narrowed valves or severely leaky valves is the cause of your heart failure. Then obviously, they require fixing. We can't fix valves with medications. They need fixed mechanically. 
So would it, that include a tabby? That may well include a tabby, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you've got lots of blockages, then bypass surgery. Occasionally, people with the heart rhythm disorder that we talked about atrial fibrillation, we can't control that. You might need some special catheter technique done through the groin to address that. Lifestyle is really, really important. Jane, you might want to talk about lifestyle. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so it's really important when you uh, have a diagnosis or, or even preventing heart failure um, from occurring from a condition like blood, high blood pressure or um, atrial fibrillation. So exercise is really important uh, to do as much as you can within your capabilities and just start off slow and steady, uh, increase it as you're able. Uh, that will give you some more energy. It will uh, give you uh, more of a routine and a, a, a increase your ability and, and stamina so you're able to do more um, of the regular things that you like doing um, uh, during your day. So really important to continue to doing exercise and it's really tricky because of course you don't always feel like doing any exercise. You're feeling tired and exhausted and uh, short of breath and it's an effort but it's actually really important just to start off slow and steady, do something a little bit every day and increase it slowly. And, and have a chat to your GP or your cardiologist or, or nurse if you are really concerned that the, you're not able to exercise at all. Um, really important too, of course, is to reduce the habits that aren't so good for you in your heart failure, uh, and uh, particularly when they go along with sedentary type behaviours. So cigarettes and alcohol, really important to keep those um, uh, none or low. Uh, really good idea to uh, eat well, so maintain a really heart healthy diet. Uh, try and uh, manage your your body weight to an, and a weight that can keep you fit and healthy. Uh, and and plan, still do things. So still find some leisure activities or travel that you are able to do. Uh, you might mean that you have to change some of the activities that you really enjoyed doing in the past, but there are so many activities and um, fun things to be able to do and, and travels, travel that you can still plan uh, even if you feel that you're not as able as you were um, a, a few years ago or at a younger age. But probably a really important one, um, Jerry, is uh, that I see a lot with my um, heart failure patients or all heart patients and I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, a diagnosis of heart failure is really scary, it's a frightening term and uh, it makes you feel like uh, you're not going to live long or that your life is over. And it's, it's, I think it's really important to uh, acknowledge that actually heart failure doesn't mean your heart's failed. It just means it's not pumping as well as it should. And there are lots of things that you can learn and do and monitor to make sure that you are living a really good quality of life and yeah. enjoying life. So yeah. having said that, I think if you are feeling uh, depressed or anxious and you have a low mood uh, and that's really common, be kind to yourself uh, and, and if, it, if it's something you can't get yourself out of, uh, there's lots of different things that you could possibly do but reach out, talk to your doctor, talk to a family member or friend. Yep. Yep. Uh, the Mental Health Foundation has a great um, uh, pho uh, free phone number 1737. They have some trained uh, counsellors that can talk to you and, and help point you in the right direction that, that, that may uh, make a big, big difference. So, yeah, yeah. it's not that it's really, really important. We're talking about it before we started. You know that, you know, with chronic diseases, and this is a chronic condition. This this doesn't go away. And again, the analogy that I, when I speak to patients, I, I, I sort of compare it to arthritis. Um, it's lots of ups and downs with it, and our role is to try to smooth that path, and you know, you know, enable people to live well in the community. Yeah. And it, but it's. It's okay to feel down, but please don't ignore it. Talk to your doctor about it, you know? And reach out to, to yep. people also, yep. friends and family in the community. Yep. And, and sometimes it can be quite lonely and you can feel quite isolated. So you do definitely reach out. There's a lot of people living with heart failure or with other long-term conditions. And yep. it's nice to be able to find some support yep. and uh, yeah, someone to meet. Yeah. So finally, before we open up for questions, just to emphasize each person's journey is different um, and you know we, we've got medications now that actually improve quality of life reduce hospitalizations and increase life expectancy and that's you know 
we are in a different place with our ability to treat heart failure in 2023 than we were in 2020. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, and that, that's fast. great. It's happening yeah. fast. But symptoms can get worse, and it's important you don't ignore your symptoms and talk to your doctor. We may consider, do we need to put one a, a device in? Is there anything else we can do differently? And I think it's there's lots of people involved who should be involved in your care, uh, from primary care to nurse, nurses in primary care, multidisciplinary team, your pharmacist. And the, the, the goal really is to improve your quality of care, quality of life by balancing medical treatment and symptoms to get the best for you. Uh, where, where you are, and you know, improve the quality of life. Yeah, live your best life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh thanks, Jerry. What? Look, shall we take some time mm -hmm. now to answer some of your questions? Um, just a reminder: please type your questions into the comments, um, and maybe don't put any uh, too much personal information in there. That would be great. So we'll just wait for one of the first questions to come up. So I've got one here from Kathleen. Oh no, I've got one from Michael, sorry. Michael's doctor said he has reduced heart function. He wants to know if this is the same as heart failure. I might ask you to see if you were listening, Jen. <laughs> yeah. So Michael, yes, um, heart function, reduced heart function is another way of, of, of saying heart failure. It is a term that's used um, interchangeably, but often, more often, because it, it doesn't sound so confronting, yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Heart failure is, is the same diagnosis. Um, do you want to add anything? No, no, no. I, 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 yeah. ex, ex, you know, I, I feel exactly similar to you. I, I think heart failure, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty emotive term. And I, I will often use your heart muscles not pumping efficiently, your heart muscles not relaxing you know, properly. Um, but it is, a, you know, we would class this as the clinical syndrome of heart failure. Uh, and I think it's, it, it is it is the same, Michael, that, you know, if, if you've got heart muscle not pumping, you've got heart failure reduced ejection fraction. Importantly, we've got, you know, good evidence uh, to support some of the treatments that we talked about, improving not just um, the quality of life, but also reducing hospitalizations and making you live longer. And um, Anne asks, can heart failure be reversed? Um, really, good, really good question, Anne. Um, and the answer for the majority of people who we see with heart failure, we, the, the damage has been done. Uh, a few exceptions may well be someone who presents with acute heart failure due to a, a rhythm disorder or acute heart failure due to an overactive thyroid. But for the vast majority of people, the damage is done and our treatments are designed to help the heart muscle work more efficiently, be it pump more efficiently or relax more efficiently. So, yeah, so it's not reversible, but it can be improved. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and life expectancy can be improved dramatically absolutely. with the treatments that we've got available today. Uh, Priscilla asks, has a heart failure, uh, oh sorry, Priscilla has heart failure and she's on no medications, is this normal? Uh, she uses a Brayo inhaler for shortness of breath and she is on blood pressure tablets. Yeah, so, uh, so it may well be that the blood pressure tablets that your doctor has you on, Priscilla, are some of the pills that we talked about, those classes of medications, um, the ACE inhibitors and the beta, blo beta blockers, maybe not the beta blockers if you've got asthma or mm. you're on a Brio inhaler, but there may well be you're on them for blood pressure, but they're also treating heart mm -hmm. failure. And Priscilla, the, a good idea too would be to go back and see your GP um, or your cardiologist and just um, ask that question. And, and you can always ask yeah. for a medication review if they want to have another look and see if they want yeah. to tweak anything. What, or, what, what's, yeah. what's, what's really important, um, I just to, to talk about medications, is you know we, we talked about water tablets. Water tablets are really, really good at getting rid of fluid. If fluid is the cause of why you're breathless, then water as you know, symptoms from heart failure. But water tablets, you know, don't reduce hospitalizations or make you live longer. 
So a lot of people that I see and treat with heart failure, and Jen, you, you'd be the same in your experience with the, with the heart group, we've got rid of the water tablets because our, they're not, the patient doesn't have much symptoms. And what we're, what we're trying to do is reduce hospitalizations with all those other medications and make, make, make patients live longer. Yeah, you're right, Jerry. So water tablets help to relieve symptoms if you have them, but they're not actually going to help your heart long yeah, term. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, that's great. Um, Marie's got a good question here. She asks, why does EF or ejection fraction fluctuate? Do we need to explain ejection fraction and then? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, f thanks, Marie, for the question. Um, so what EF is, is it, it, it is a measure of how your heart muscle is, is, is pumping. Uh, and it, the, the, there is variability in when we measure it. That's, that's the first thing I would say. Um, but it may fluctuate. It may, you know, our, our expectation and our hope is with treatment of some of the treatments that we discussed that it will actually get better. And I think we're seeing that with some of the newer treatments specifically that we see quite dramatic improvements in ejection fraction. Is that, is that your experience yeah, in the heart group as well? It has been, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and ejection fraction really is just um, a, a percentage of how much blood is, is able to be pumped out of your main pumping chamber um, and round your body or out of that main pumping chamber at each heartbeat. Yeah. So it is a, a bit of a, a good measure of the strength of your heart muscle, how effective it is, how efficient it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom asks, what does Entresto do? Yeah, so it's so, a so good, good question, Tom. Um, Entresto is, it, it, it's... It's got one of those classes of medications that we discussed, um, the ARBs, and another added component, and it actually helps the heart muscle, again, work more efficiently, so pump more efficiently, essentially. Also believe it helps the heart muscle relax more efficiently as well, because we've got some data to suggest that it improves symptoms uh, and may reduce hospitalization in people with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as well. And I, I believe in the United States, it's now got an indication for use in, in that group okay. as well. And how long have we had Entresto, Jim? Entresto in New Zealand. It's quite an exciting drug, isn't it? Yeah, so Entresto in New Zealand is yeah. still only available under special authority. So what does that mean? It means that um, you will have had to trial one of the other classes of medications, the ARBs or the ACE inhibitors. Uh, and if your heart muscles not got better or you, or you remain symptomatic with that, then you're eligible to go on and trust those. So we've had it probably about six or six, 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 six or seven years, I think. Okay, fantastic. Now, Karina would like to know uh, if a Takotsubo syndrome is a form of heart failure and what can be done if you experience it? Yeah. Do you want to take this one, Jed? <laughs> uh, well, Takotsubo is quite rare. Uh, it's more common for women. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's also known as broken heart syndrome. Uh, and it was something that uh, many years ago we didn't really um, understand at all and was often dismissed. Uh, but it is, a, it is a real syndrome. It tends, it, it's basically an acute or sudden form of heart failure. Um, and it's of two thirds of, of Takotsubo syndrome people, or well, those that experience it, um, find that it's been triggered by an emotional or, or quite a major emotional or physical stressor. So it could be something like um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a death or, or surgery or um, car accident, uh, asthma attack, marriage breakup, that sort of thing. We get a sudden huge yep. surge yep. So, of adrenaline. So, so, so it is, yeah, it, it, that, that's exactly what, 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 what it is. It tends to be that big adrenaline surge, a sympathetic activity. And, and it's actually a heart attack, isn't it? you end up uh, blocking an artery and the, the, the fact you block the artery, you end up with a bit of heart muscle that's not working well. Um, more often than not, the heart muscle improves uh, reasonably quickly with time, but we would still use the evidence-based treatment that we talked about in quite a number of people who we would see who present with Tagasubos for a period of time. And from what I understand with Tagasubo syndrome, uh, it doesn't tend to have any long-term um, ill effects on the heart, unlike uh, traditional heart failure. Um, and it, it's, it is rare, and I don't think that it happens uh, if you've, you've had Takotsubo syndrome, it doesn't necessarily increase your risk of having a second episode, or are we not sure about that? Not, we're not certified that, uh, yeah. I, I, 
I, I'm not aware of any evidence to say that you've you've selected yourself as someone at increased risk of, of further events. Okay, awesome. Uh, great questions, everyone. I keep bringing them through. They're, they're really, really good. Uh, chaos, I have no thyroid after thyroid cancer. Can you please mention the connection with heart failure? Uh, so so we, we, we know that uh, if your thyroid is really overactive, it can cause heart failure. We also know if your thyroid is really underactive, it can cause heart failure, but the, the one we would more commonly see is a really overactive thyroid. More often than not, that's associated with atrial fibrillation, because an overactive thyroid and atrial fibrillation go hand in hand. Um, but, sorry, can I just see the... So, so, so again, there... So it is a really low thyroid may be associated, but it, it's quite an uncommon cause for someone presenting with heart failure. So if Kay has no thyroid, she'll be on medication you thyroxine? Almost, and yeah, well, you should be on th yeah, yeah. Yeah, thyroid replacement therapy. Yeah, right, yeah. and so her risk of uh, heart failure is, is, is low. low. Due, or risk of heart failure due to thyroid problems is actually right. is very low. Yeah. Another question, great questions coming through. Thanks again, everyone. Maxine asks, if you had rheumatic fever as a child, can that make you more likely to have heart failure? Re really, really important question and, you know, appropriate for us in, in Aotearoa because, you know, the, the burden of rheumatic heart disease that we see as a result of rheumatic fever is, is high and falls unequally, almost exclusively, on our Pacific and Māori populations in New Zealand. And it can, unfortunately, Maxine, make you at risk of heart failure later in life. Uh, why? It tends to relate to the valve. So the valve may be damaged as a result of the rheumatic fever. And that valve may become more leaky as time marches on, or more narrow with time as well. Uh, and you may unfortunately have more than one valve involved. So, so yes, it can, uh, and it's, it's almost always due to valve scarring that progresses over time and can cause heart failure. And generally, if you've had rheumatic fever, um, Maxine, you'll be treated, obviously, for that. Uh, and you should be monitored or followed up yeah, for yeah, looking yeah, for signs yeah. of Alzheimer's yeah, 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 disease yeah, yeah. as an adult. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Yeah. So re yeah, really important if you have had rheumatic fever that uh, you are seen and followed up. Uh, and we would do an echo scan, that, that ultrasound scan. And I'm sure, Maxine, if you've had or have got a family member that had rheumatic fever, they will have had echo scans done. And we, we would follow people up over the years just to make sure, if the, particularly if there is any degree of scarring there, uh, to, just just to see if that progresses or changes as you know with time because not all people who have rheumatic fever will necessarily have rheumatic heart disease or valve problems we're just looking at yeah yep yep yep, 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 yep. Uh, and then we have a question from Kathleen Kathleen is 71 and was diagnosed with diastolic dysfunction four years ago she asks, if I'm only stage one why are my symptoms so bad I'm exhausted making the bed or walking up one flight of stairs I'm on salazapril, beta lock, and cardism. I haven't seen my cardiologist for over a year, but I've been this way from the start. Any helpful advice? Yeah, um, well, well, the first thing that I, I, I would say, um, I, I think you, I would recommend being reviewed by your cardiologist, Kathleen, because uh, from what you say there, it, 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 things don't add up to me. So I think reviewing your symptoms, reviewing the investigations, um, Reviewing that, that, that little blood test we, we talked about, for example, that's a really important yeah, test yes. for you. Uh, so I, I the, think the, the, the BNP, yeah. so it's a blood test. And I, I, I think been reviewed, particularly, you know, you, you sound very limited with your symptoms. So I think it really is important that you, you do catch up with your cardiologist again. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Kathleen. Hopefully you can, uh, someone can help you with that. And our next question here, Marina asks, what part does cholesterol play in heart failure? Why are only tests done for LDL and HDL? Yeah. Um, so, Jane, do you want to take the bit about cholesterol? So why, why is cholesterol important in, so, in 
uh, cholesterol is a risk factor for coronary artery disease. Uh, and if you have high cholesterol, you have a higher risk of having coronary artery disease. So that's just a silting up of your coronary arteries. Uh, and then, of course, you, you have that risk of having a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Uh, so, and of course, we know people with a history of coronary artery disease or a heart attack uh, have a higher risk for heart failure. Uh, why only test done for LDL and HDL? Uh, I know that we certainly look closely at LDL. There's less evidence to, uh, to say that HDL is the cardioprotective type of um, lipoprotein. Uh, and I think we still look at triglycerides too, don't we? Yeah, I know LDL yeah. will certainly be the main test. I, I, I think the question probably relates to why why don't we test for other you know subfractions of lipids, uh, L, uh, okay. little a and stuff. Uh, I think we can, for, for the vast majority of people that we would see, Marina, we will we will get you know most of the advice we will we will we will get will be based on LDL and, and HDL. Um, some people we may want to do further lipid analysis. So we can go further yeah, down yeah, into subgroups yeah, 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 of those groups. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Tracy asks, can diet help? For example, plant-based, low-fat or no oil? Does this reduce further damage? And Tracy, I'm presuming you're talking about heart failure? Or would, can diet help for heart failure? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> so, well, um, uh, I think that uh, diet is important. For anybody with any heart condition or otherwise, and certainly that alongside that or within that group would be heart failure patients as well. Um, plant-based is it's certainly important to have more plant-based foods in our yep. diet. Yep. Um, uh, low fat is good. There are certainly good types of oil that you can still have, Tracy. Uh, and there's lots of information on our Heart Foundation website about. Yeah. Um, I, about yeah. I, so I, I, I think um, the most heart health the most heart healthy diet, I believe, it remains the Mediterranean diet. And the Mediterranean diet, and I'm not saying anything controversial in the heart, the heart foundation, but the Mediterranean diet involves, you know, it, it's plant-based, um, low meat and high oil, uh, olive oil specifically, low dairy. And I think that is a, that is a really good balanced diet. And I think that is a but is good for your overall cardiac well-being. You'd agree with that? Good. And it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually, the, it will be low sodium as well because of the lack of, um, you know, processed meats That's and true. stuff as well. True. Uh, Mike said, I have I've reasonably well controlled hypertension for 30 years. I'm not convinced my BP medication is optimal and I've been halving it at times with variable B B uh, blood pressure measurements, so they're varied when you've been halving your medication. Is it likely I will have a degree of heart failure? How can I get a definitive diagnosis? Yeah, so, sorry, so, can so I just the, see the... So the first part is about, um, um, Mike's had um, reasonably well-controlled hypertension for 30 years, but he wasn't convinced his medication is optimal. Yeah. If, but when you say it's optimal, Mike, do you mean that because uh, you've been having it. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 a re really, really important topic: high blood pressure and and um, heart failure. It, you know, it, it is one of the common sequelae of poorly treated blood pressure over many years. And blood pressure, incredibly common in New Zealand. Twenty to thirty percent of adults have got elevated blood pressure. Uh, one in two of us over the age of 65 have got elevated blood pressure. And only about one in five people with blood pressure have it optimally controlled. So you're not alone in not having your blood pressure optimally controlled. Unfortunately, it can become harder to control as we get older. And I think that, 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 is, a, that is something that we see commonly. Um, so I think it's important that and you've all, you obviously are, Mike, taking your own blood pressure. I, I would advise that you take it at the same time of the day, two to three times a week. Um, share those readings with your GP. I think if you're concerned you have heart failure, I would actually get, I, I would ask for one of those blood tests that we talked about at BNP. The other thing that we're seeing, you know, more and more is trying to pick up people who may be at risk early with heart failure. And there's research, this is, this is going on, you know, research in this area currently. Can biomarkers, which are blood tests and other markers, identify someone who may be at risk 
such as yourself, mm -hmm. and that's where BMP might actually help. Yeah. And I think your, your medications are, you know, likely need to be reviewed. Yeah, I'm just I'm wondering why Mike feel been having them at times, and whether that was because when you say your blood pressure medication is, you're not sure it's whether it's optimal, whether you've been having uh, lighty little dizziness yeah, yeah, episodes, yeah. and that's why you've halved it. Yeah. But it is it is important to, and I think Jim is quite right. If you're able to get some uh, regular monitoring, your home monitoring, and have have a bit of a history, a couple of weeks of blood pressure measurement, it's really helpful for your GP or cardiologist to look at that, see any trends, look at your yeah. average blood pressure. Um, and ideally, for someone who's diagnosed with blood pressure, we want to try and keep that below 130 and below 90. Yep. So 130, yep. the top figure, systolic, and below 90, diastolic, yep. uh, and see if we can help um, manage your and, blood pressure yeah. better and reduce yeah. the and, risk. And, you know, as Jane mentioned, we increasingly recognise the benefit of home blood pressure monitoring. You know, we've now got trials telling us, you know, how important home blood pressure monitoring is better than going into, into the office. And don't forget, blood pressures like this, as the day your blood pressure and that's why getting the one time you know and i i don't know what you what you said but i i, I recommend in the evening uh you know relax sit down take two to three readings just before you're getting ready for bed um and that you know maybe do that twice a week uh, but you know don't be doing it two three times a day um i think it's you know a couple of times a week if it's settled after that, then I don't think you need to keep doing it that frequently either. Right, yes. No, we, I tend to, um, I have to say, Jerry ask my patients to do it a bit more than that. <laughs> um, and I just, I, obviously, it depends um, on the patient. And, 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 and you don't want to feel so hypervigilant you're stressing about your, your blood pressure and that increases it. But um, yeah. I tend to ask patients to do it just for two or three weeks and then stop. And I ask them to do it. Um, once in the morning, once at night, or well, actually twice in the morning, twice at night. Yeah. Uh, because after that, first reading is quite high, um, and the second reading is more accurate. Uh, write it down, put the time I, of day, I, and then yeah. send that off to your I think it's it, I think it's important getting the balance, you know, getting the balance, you know, um, not becoming obsessed yeah. about it, but, but getting, you know, getting it's sufficient accurate, readings yeah. to make informed decisions, to enable us to make informed decisions together about what yeah. we do. How to give your GP give some clues yeah. about yeah. what's going yeah. on. So the, the next question is an interesting one. It's uh, it's one, uh, can a SCAD, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, heart attack cause heart failure? So what, what SCAD is, is um, where you get, instead of, when, when someone has a heart attack, it's usually due to blockages in the arteries that's, that, that close off due to clot forming. With a SCAD, you get a tear in the artery, not related to a blockage, and the artery can unfold and block as well. So unfortunately, the answer to your question is it can cause heart failure. Why? Because it can block the artery off completely. And if you block the artery off completely, that heart muscle can die. So it can cause heart failure. It, it's a much less common form of, of a heart attack but we're recognizing it more, and we know that it occurs more in women than men. Um, I think we're recognizing it more because our diagnostic ability with our cath labs and our CT scans allow us to pick this up. Um, we probably haven't recognized it as much in the past because our image quality has not been that good. And possibly because we didn't have access to having angiograms so quickly, uh, because often that dissection can be healed and, and not seen um, if you leave yep. an, an angiogram yep. to, to later. So it's something that um, yep. needs to probably be picked up in the acute stage. Yep. Yep. Uh, Melissa asks, uh, Melissa has congenital pulmonary stenosis and COA of the aorta, low heart rate and high blood pressure. I also don't sleep well, always waking up. Can I get heart failure from this? Um, yeah. Thanks for the question, Melissa. I, I'm not a congenital heart disease expert, um, but we know that congenital heart disease, and it depends on the severity of the conditions that you've mentioned there, that they can cause heart failure and cause other symptoms as well. Um, high blood pressure with coarctation of the aorta, it's one of, it's one of the causes that we see uh, of high blood pressure, and often treatment of the coarctation is necessary to treat the high blood pressure, but we will, you know, almost always um, treat with blood pressure pills as well. 
So if you've got symptoms that you're concerned about, then I think it's important you discuss them with your doctor and you may well want to be reviewed. I'm sure you're involved, you, you, I'm sure you are being seen by yeah, congenital heart disease heart specialist too. and you may want to um, catch up with them as well. And Melissa, I'm not sure where you are in New Zealand, but there's um, some really good congenital, adult congenital heart uh, services, certainly in Auckland, but I think they are nationwide, so that would be worth your welcome to um, email into the Heart Foundation. We can help you if you need to look for some support. Yeah. Um, yeah. Peggy is 61 with bradycardia. That's a slow heart rate. Uh, while I wait for a hospital appointment, am I at risk of heart failure? Um, as a result of the bradycardia itself, Peggy, almost certainly not, but there may be other things going on that might increase your risk. But but specifically with regard to the bradycardia, I, I believe that's highly unlikely. Um, Jane, have you any No, it, I, it, difficult to know really, Peggy. Um, bradycardia is not a, a, a common symptom or problem with heart failure. It tends to be a heart fire, uh, faster heart rate. Uh, and you haven't mentioned your blood pressure, so I'm presuming that's normal. Uh, so I'm sorry that you're still waiting for an appointment. Uh, and um, if, if, you, if you find that you're getting symptoms of bradycardia, so I know this is not really heart failure focused, but if you are um, nighty and dizziness and you're finding that um, uh, you might you know, fainting or uh, problems like that, it is probably worth going back to see your GP um, if these symptoms get worse so that they can uh, perhaps write into the hospital again and uh, try and increase your um, a priority to be seen yeah. for if you really are feeling unwell yeah, then you just need to call an ambulance and, and um, go and see, go to the hospital straight away if you're feeling very unwell. Yeah, I, I, I agree, I agree with um, um, So, so I'll, I'll read the next question. So what is the risk of heart failure when one suffers from an aortic aneurysm and hypertension? Currently Hubby is waiting for a follow-up assessment. Last year the cardiovascular team said they'll monitor it. So with respect to the, the, the risk of heart failure, it doesn't relate to the aneurysm, it relates to high blood pressure. And we know high blood pressure, as we discussed earlier, is a common cause of heart failure. However, if blood pressure is treated well, the risk of developing heart failure is actually quite small. So, so it just emphasizes the importance of treating blood pressure. Treating blood pressure well is also really important uh, for the aortic aneurysm. And, uh, it, it, yeah, if I'm, if I'm seeing someone who's got an aortic aneurysm and I'm following them up in my clinic, I tend to set my blood pressure targets lower than the ones that Jane was mentioning earlier. So 120, 80 or better, as opposed to 130, 90 or better. And we know that good blood pressure control um, is important in, prevent, in, in preventing the aneurysm getting bigger. Exactly. I've, I've said exactly the same, Jerry. Um, uh, and, and lifestyle measures too. So yep, I know yep, that yep, um, yep. you know the, the things that your husband can do also to help reduce his blood pressure is reduce stress, regular exercise, to, to as guided by his doctor or cardiologist, yeah. uh, um, um, heart healthy diet, uh, all the things that will also help meditation, relaxation, um, all those things that can also help reduce your blood pressure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Pila asks. Are continued follow-ups needed after broken heart syndrome? Yeah, I did, really good, really good question. So, so what, what do I do? Um, so we we would see someone that's got this condition or tagasup was a broken heart uh, in the clinic. Uh, if the heart muscle function is back to normal, uh, which Jane mentioned, invariably it, it does. Occasionally it doesn't, but invariably it, it gets back to normal. Um, and you know, six months, twelve months down the line, we would not necessarily, you know, bring you back to see a cardiologist. Um, so, so I think everyone's an individual, and it depends, you know, where things are, particularly with your heart, with the expectation that your heart muscle has got better, everything's well. Then we would look at, um, you know, your GP looking after you from then on. And that, that's the thing with Takasubo syndrome yep. or broken heart is that generally there's no long-term damage to your heart muscles. So, um, Jean suffered an emergency heart failure in March. Nelly didn't make it. I'm sorry to hear that, um, Jean. Could this happen again? I am taking all precautions, including 1,500 fluid per day, so the fluid restriction, yeah. 1,500 yeah. mils. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so, so what Jane's describing, you remember we, we talked at the beginning about acute presentations with heart failure and you know, living well with heart failure in the community. And the aim of our treatment is to, is to prevent what's, ha what's happened. One of the aims, goals of our treatment is to prevent this sort of situation happening. Unfortunately, Jane, even with the best treatment, we can't, we can't say that it will never happen again. Um, how do we reduce the likelihood of it happening again? It's making sure you're on good evidence-based treatment. So are you on, the, are you on uh, an ACE inhibitor, a, a, a beta blocker, Entresto if you're eligible for it, an aldosterone antagonist? Are you eligible for one of those new medications that we talked about? Um, so it's taking, you know, it's us also working with you to make sure that you're on the best treatment we've got available to us in 2023 in New Zealand. The other thing about heart failure, I, I didn't mention it, but but we know now that if you come into hospital uh, with acute heart failure, such as what you mentioned here, that there's huge benefit in getting you getting you started on all those four classes of medications if we're able to do so before you go home and increasing the doses as quickly as we can when you go home. And we know that that reduces your chances of coming back to hospital pretty quickly. Uh, you know, within 30 days, we're reducing that chance of coming back to hospital. And it's actually safe to do. So we've been a bit hesitant about doing some of this stuff. So I think we as health professionals need to do this better as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's a, 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 a quite a re, re, new um, yeah. uh, sort of discovery, but evidence-based uh, change in practice in that uh, we used to be a lot slower at what we called up titrating, which just means increasing the dose of your heart medications to the optimal dose, the dose that's going to make the most difference and help your heart the most effectively. And I think for, um, for non-medical people, people, lay people that are, have heart conditions, it feels like if you're in a really high dose that there's nowhere else to go and that means you're at the end of your um, heart failure um, and you're not well. It doesn't. It actually means that you're in the, you're, the getting you up to the, to the topmost dose that, that you could manage yeah. actually yeah. will yeah. improve. And, and, you know, and again, just to circle back around to, to the medications, clinicians, we, we really are quite frustrated at not having access to, you know, everything that our colleagues overseas have and are available on with guidelines then we should we should be using these medications there's no excuse not to use these medications so that's part of our role as the heart foundation to continue to advocate pharmac and ministry of health the fataora to Fiora, to get access to these medications for all new zealanders with heart failure oh look thank you so much everyone for all your questions tonight uh, we haven't had a chance to answer all of them and if we haven't answered yours we'll get one of our nursing team to come back to you i really appreciate your engagement and some very very good questions that have come through tonight uh, we have one final question and uh, this question tonight comes from shelly uh, shelly asks when you take your blood pressure which arm is the best one to use jim i'm gonna let you do that one <laughs> i don't think it matters shelly yeah. um, right or left uh, uh, the, the, if you've had um, breast cancer and you've had um, a, a mastectomy or lymph node clearance, uh, we used to be cautious about um, taking blood pressure on that side. I understand from the latest evidence that's not an issue, actually. It's, oh, really? Yeah, yep. and that, yep. Uh, yep. Uh, although it's still very common that people say, oh, I've had a mastectomy, I can't have my blood pressure taken on, on, on that side. But the, uh, uh, so it, it doesn't matter, and I think that if you were taking it yourself every day yeah. at home or, or, yeah or yeah so it's important you use the same side um there may be you know it's acceptable to have about a 10 millimeter difference on what you know between the left and the right but so you know, choose people, one yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> choose yeah. one but uh yeah. no it doesn't matter yeah. right well it looks like we covered most of the questions or that we have time for anyway to do tonight Oh, Jerry, is there anything else you'd like to cover uh, before we wrap any take-home message for everyone right i i i, I guess Coming back to what we started with, heart failure matters. It really does matter. There's a lot of us in New Zealand living with heart failure. And I, I, I think our role is, as health professionals, and as a heart foundation, is to you know make sure that we are enabling people to live well with heart failure. 
to, to not come to hospital with heart failure and actually reduce more, mortal, you know, mortality from heart failure. And I think in 2023, with the options that we've got, we should be able to do all of those things. Yeah, I agree, and I think it's about quality of your life. There's much that you can do despite having heart failure, and uh, and it's important to yeah. to acknowledge that and, and, yeah. and be positive and know that there's lots of treatments, and also um, for you out there with heart failure to take control yourself, find out as much information you can, uh, do your own monitoring, get, get really, um, uh, uh, understand your yep. symptoms yep. and what triggers them and, and, and really feel um, confident to manage, uh, manage and monitor your heart failure as well yourself alongside your doctor. Yep. And again, yep. the Heart Foundation has yep. a lot of resources actually, I meant to bring this up earlier, Jerry. Yep. Yep. Uh, many of you may have seen this, we have a heart failure pack, we have a great booklet uh, support for carers for, or family members supporting somebody with heart failure that's got a lot of really good information in it. We have our heart failure daily checks record and we have a fantastic heart failure action plan that I would hope you can certainly ask your GP or cardiologist for one of those. They're available on our website. You can phone our, our 0800 line <coughs> or the Heart Foundation's line to order any of these resources. And there's lots of information too that I'm sure um, our lovely uh, uh, colleagues will be able to put up on the chat uh, some, with some links to our heart failure hub. So lots of lots of stuff that lots of positive stuff yeah. you can do to to help manage your heart failure. Yeah. So thanks so much everyone uh, who have participated today. Really appreciate you um, joining us and asking some fantastic questions. Thank you for thank you. Thank you. For, so you are incredible speaker, Dr. Jerry Devlin, our Heart Foundation Medical Director. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, and as I say, if we haven't been able to respond to your questions. We'll definitely try and get those through to our nurses and respond by email, but just give us a week or two. Thanks very much. Evening, everyone. Bye-bye.